All right, and we're back. And now get Charlotte. Yes. So the previous talk is just over, uh, and now we are switching from the invited talk to the contributed abstracts and the most popular ones. And so I'm glad to tell you that uh, Veronica Proven has submitted an abstract that has been uh, voted strongly by the community. So it's my pleasure to welcome you on stage. Uh, so you're you. a postdoctoral researcher at the Medical Center Hamburg Eppendorf. And so the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, and thanks so much uh, for um, the interest of the audience uh, in, uh, in, my, in my work. So I will uh, talk about efficient computing of high-dimensional neural representations with biologically plausible spiking networks. And uh, yeah, I have to apologize to my collaborator and my um, advisors that I forgot to mention them uh, when I sent my abstract. So I did uh, this project in collaboration with uh, Simone, which, who is uh, my colleague in the lab. Uh, and I was advised for the first part uh, by Thilo Schwalger from Technical University Berlin, and now for the second part by Stefano Panzeri. So um, this uh, project is uh, um, within a bigger framework of efficient coding with spiking neural networks. Uh, this is um, a theory developed over the past maybe 10 years um, about how to model spiking dynamics from a functional perspective and using a norm normative approach, in this case, efficient coding. And uh, so there is also a line of work that cares about biological plausibility and interpretability of results in order to um, have models that are also relevant to biology. And uh, here I'm, um, we are building on a recent previous uh, results, um, but we focus on a uh, question how does coding efficiency in, of a spiking neural network relate to neural dynamics, such as firing rates, spiking variability, or EI balance, and uh, how, um, how does coding efficiency relate to properties of uh, biological networks that can be observed. And I guess the um, underlying question that um, it's um, more like deeper uh, for an interesting in neurobiology is the question if biological networks are efficient and if they are in what way, um, which, with what parameters and so on. So uh, let me now just uh, uh, present some concepts uh, of the model. So uh, the model it would receive uh, some uh, stimulus. Uh, we imagine this is a feature of an external stimulus in the external world. And uh, the, the goal of the network is to compute uh, some function of this external stimulus. This would be uh, the target signal, X of T. Uh, and to do that, uh, the network would spike uh, whenever the neural representation uh, that we can read out from the spiking activity is, um, is uh, far away from the target signal, um, an appropriate neuron will activate and spike to bring this um, readout closer to the target signal. So um, here um, we use um, our uh, stimulus feature, uh, we model it as an ornstein ullenbeck process to have some biologically uh, plausible uh, input. Uh, and then we impose uh, this uh, simple relation um, for, uh, on uh, the target signal. So the network would simply um, want to uh, estimate um, a low-pass filtered um, integration of the, tar of, the of the stimulus feature. And uh, then we assume the population readout uh, where we sum spikes. So this F is for the spike train. We some spikes across neurons, uh, weighting them with uh, with weights W, and uh, again uh, this uh, this linear sum will be low pass filtered. So we um, we um, assume there can be several um, signals that can be encoded by this network. Uh, that's why we have several dimensions uh, of the stimulus uh, coming from these several features of the stimulus. Um, and in order to be able to, um, to encode this um, multitude of signals efficiently, we assign to every neuron a selectivity vector. And so you can uh, represent, we can represent this here with um, 
uh, with this uh, matrix of selectivity weights that um, where each neuron has a vector which describes the selectivity of this particular neuron for each one of the of the features that uh, we want to encode. So to impose efficiency, uh, we pose a loss function. This function loss function is very simple. It just takes into account some encoding error uh, of the network and some cost on spiking. Uh, and the two quantities are weighted with the constant beta. Um, and now the excitatory population uh, will have as encoding error the square distance between the target signal and the readout of the spiking activity from excitatory neurons, while uh, the inhibitory population will um, have as an um, encoding error the distance between the two uh, readouts of the so readout of the excitatory and of the inhibitory population. And uh, then both uh, uh, populations also have a, have a cost on spiking, which is simply a sum of low-pass filtered um, spike trains across neurons. Uh, now, similarly to previous work, we assume that there should be a spike fired only if this would uh, decrease uh, the loss function in the next time step. And um, we also add some uh, noise to this rule for biological plausibility, thinking that uh, such a rule cannot really be um, exactly um, implemented in biology. Now, um, from, uh, from these simple assumptions, uh, we um, analytically uh, derive um, a neural uh, model, so a model of uh, spiking neural dynamics. And interestingly, it turns out that this model can be written as a generalized leaky integrator and fire uh, neural model. So the, yeah, the model will obey this uh, subthreshold uh, dynamics of the membrane potential, where we have a leak current, then we have synaptic currents, local currents, and external currents. Um, the, um, as the membrane potential reaches a threshold, it, uh, the neuron spikes and resets uh, the membrane potential. And uh, we have that um, all, the, all, the, um, all the terms in this model are, well, at the same time, they are biologically uh, interpretable, but they are also directly related to the variables uh, that we imposed as, uh, in, the, in our optimization problem. So, for example, the firing threshold is proportional to the length of the selectivity vector of the spiking neuron. And this is also the case of the reset, which also depends on the metabolic parameter beta. So, let's have a look at the synaptic currents. Uh, so, we find that synaptic currents are proportional, in case of excitatory neurons, they are proportional in a linear sum of the features. And uh, we also have a term with recurrent inhibition. And the synaptic currents inhibitor neurons uh, uh, consist of recurrent excitation, recurrent inhibition. So, um, very important uh, rule or uh, result of, 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 this work, uh, of this model is that the synaptic connection between neurons I and J is, um, is proportional to the similarity of the selectivity vectors of the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neuron. So this uh, simple rule will uh, describe all uh, the strength of all synaptic connection, and this is uh, what we call the structured uh, stru structured connectivity. So to illustrate uh, this, um, you, you can think of the space of the features. Um, uh, let's say that we have two features, and our selectivity vectors they live in this uh, feature space. Uh, so let's say we have. Um, a vector for the neuron I and for the neuron J, and the more similar they are, the bigger is their uh, their dot product. And in our in the case of our model, we will have that uh, this the more similar the the selectivities of the two neurons are, the stronger the synapse between them. Okay, so um, we besides the synaptic currents, we also have a, a local current and an external current. The local current is a uh, spike-triggered current. Uh, so when a neuron spikes, it, uh, it triggers this current to itself. And it's um, depending on the, on, um, 
these network parameters, so metabolic constant and time time constants of the of the model. And um, we also finally have an external current, which is proportional uh, to the negative metabolic cost and this spiking. Uh, so this noise that we that we assumed in the um, rule for spiking. So yeah, this uh, with this uh, we have a complete description of a spiking neural network. Um, but uh, we have a bunch of free parameters uh, of the of the model. So in order to uh, constrain the model, what we do is to um, well to simulate the equations that we derived, and we measure the average error cost and the loss of the model, and uh, then we look for uh, parameters that minimize the loss. So here I plotted uh, the loss uh, loss measures for um, four different parameters, uh, more as an illustration. So um, here is the are the loss measures at the, uh, as a function of the metabolic constant beta, uh, noise intensity. Uh, this is the ratio of E to I neurons in the network, and this is the number of um, variables that we give to the network. So I will maybe comment on uh, on the noise. So interestingly, uh, we see that. The network prefers to have some noise in the memory potential, um, and this is uh, so some noise actually decreases the root mean squared error that we measure um, at, the, at the population level. Um, at the, so when we measure the optimal uh, ratio of E to I neurons, uh, we find that this ratio is uh, at about four to one. Which interestingly is also the ratio that we know from it's uh, known from measurements in the biological networks. Um, another interesting uh, result is that the, the network actually prefers to encode more than one variable. So um, when we weight the error uh, stronger than the cost, we find that the network prefers to encode uh, three variables actually, instead of uh, not just one. Um, here I'm also showing the um, uh, estimation of the optimal uh, time constants, um, and uh, we find that the, and these time constants they will determine this uh, local current. We find that uh, the model is optimal in the regime with adaptation, in particular uh, adaptation in excitatory neurons, and maybe very weak adaptation in inhibitory neurons. Uh, so now, uh, when we have uh, constrained the model to uh, its optimal parameters, uh, we can check uh, how does the neural dynamics look like, and um, as well as um, yeah, we can we can check the neural dynamics as well as how well are we in estimating our our um, stimuli. So, um, as a first thing, uh, I wanted to point out that. The network is an unbiased estimator. Uh, so here I plotted the realization of the target signal in a particular trial and the uh, the estimate uh, of this of this target signal in three different trials. So you can see that the network is uh, very good in tracking target signal. And as I measured the bias of these um, estimators, uh, I have found that uh, actually they are centered. The bias is centered at zero, meaning that the yeah the estimates are actually uh, really uh, precise. Uh, we find that for this uh, constrained network, firing rates are in biological ranges. Uh, they are um, yeah very uh, what we would expect to see in biology. Uh, we find a strong uh, single neuron trial to trial variability with a coefficient of uh, variation of about one. And we also find a tight EI balance. So when we look in the um, at the excitatory and inhibitory synaptic currents uh, that come to single neurons, we see that they are uh, temporally correlated uh, you know, quite strongly uh, over time. So uh, next, we tested this network. Uh, there's about thirty seconds left, so it's necessary to wrap up. At this point. Okay. Um, Okay, so 
yeah, let me yeah just do it very quickly. So um, here I tested the network without a stimulus, where I have driven a single neuron with an excitatory current, and I measured the response of other new excitatory neurons, distinguishing similar similar and different uh, stimulus selectivity. And what we see is that uh, neurons with different uh, selectivity they don't uh, react much, but neurons with similar selectivity show um, a strong negative deviation from their baseline firing rate, uh, which is um, a, a measure of basically lateral inhibition uh, for these neurons which sim with similar selectivity. Um, and um, I think it's my last slide. So I have also um, tested the recurrent connectivity by removing the structure of connectivity that is predicted uh, by the theory. And when I when I did so, I have found um, a, quite a strong increase in the error as well as in the cost and spiking uh, of this network. Uh, on the contrary, when I added random heterogeneity to synaptic weights, uh, I have found that the network is robust to quite the strong levels of uh, heterogeneity, and also the dynamics would not change much for by adding this heterogeneity. Okay, so to sum up, I uh, have um, I have said, um, described a recurrent EI spiking neural network, which is built from efficient coding theory. Uh, the model encodes uh, high dimensional signals. Uh, it's an unbiased estimator. It's robust to heterogeneity in the synaptic connectivity. And uh, the structural features that are analytically derived, such as adaptation or structured connectivity, I think are uh, relevant for biology. And interestingly, we also see that optimal parameters, they are close or coincide with what we know from uh, biological networks. Uh, with this, uh, yeah, if you want to know more about the theory, I would invite you to look at this. Um, a paper from uh, NeurIPS from last year, and with this, I'm open to your questions. Thank you for a very nice talk. We currently have uh, two questions. So first one from Friedman Zinke. It seems the network is very good at auto-encoding variables. We get non-linearly transferring in inputs. Sorry, can you repeat the last sentence? Yeah, now normally it should appear now on the screen. Uh, so it seems the network is very good at auto-encoding variables. How mm -hmm. can you make it non-linearly transforming input? So we here um, studied basically, uh, yeah, this is somehow simplified um, computation of, um, well, uh, integrating the, the, the feature uh, and the features are independent across each other, but uh, our current work also deals, as well as this uh, NeurIPS paper, also deals with interaction across features. It is uh, totally possible to extend this network to uh, interaction uh, across features, so mixing of features. Um, uh, we have not yet uh, worked on um, non-linear um, interaction, but uh, it is also a uh, plan to, uh, ex as an extension. The second question, also from Friedman Zinke. In the Berlin et al. work, inhibition needs to be infinitely fast. Is this similar here? So, uh, yeah, here we uh, actually have this um, fast synapses. Yeah, so these are, um, these are uh, spike trains. Um, in contrast to the Berlin paper, however, there they, uh, they assumed that um, yeah, they implemented this network a little bit differently. Um, so, um, yeah, they, uh, so, so here our implementation is closer to biology, but we nevertheless still have, um, this uh, very fast interaction, uh, across neurons, uh, but our current work is also extending this to a realistic, uh, synaptic time constants and, uh, yeah, the network still, uh, works fine. So it's, uh, yeah. Again, an extension uh, of this current work. Okay, we have time for one last question. Uh, this time from Bill Vodlaski. Do you have some intuition for why the network performs better when including three variables versus one or two? I would expect performance to be inversely related to the number of coding dimensions. 
Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I do not have a, a very good answer on this, um, actually. Um, so, what what I can say is that uh, the encoding error really has a minimum at the uh, at the uh, three or four. Or let's say if we look at the inhibitor neurons, um, while the cost uh, the cost is. Uh, uh, is increasing as a as a function of um, number of encoded variables. So looking only at the cost, we would be better off encoding just one variable. But looking at the error, um, it's better to encode uh, more variables. So my uh, guess is that this is due to the well uh, the number of so these are three uh, independent uh, features. Uh, these three variables and the network likes to uh, to to have a certain Basically, uh, dynamics. Um, uh, let me let me put this. Aside. So the network encodes uh, optimally when it has a certain dynamics, and it will achieve this dynamics um, better when it has three uh, in independent inputs to its uh, as a, its feed forward current compared to just one. This is more like a guess, but uh, this is uh, the best I can I can comment about it. Okay, no more questions. Uh, thank you so much again for your very nice talk. And now, everyone, it's the time to switch to the next room. Thank you so much.